today. So in this clip, we're going to be going over five of the uh, CLEP Perplet Calculus sample test questions. Um, these are just sample test questions to acquaint you with the level of difficulty of the calculus um, exam uh, that the PLEP administers. If you want to get more practice, you can go to this website, PLEP.org. They have a, a full practice uh, handout, a booklet for sale. I think it's about ten dollars. You can visit the site and buy buy that uh, publication to study. Okay, and you can also go to macgoself.com to sharpen your skills on on calculus. All right, let's go ahead and uh, go ahead go over the questions. Um, let's we'll start with number one. The first one says, "What is the limit as x approaches one uh, of one minus x squared over x to the fourth minus x?" Uh, let me rewrite the question here so I can work on it. So we have, uh, we're looking for the limit as x approaches 1 of 1 minus x squared over x to the 4 minus x. You can clearly see here that when I, if I plug in 1, I'll end up with a 0 on the bottom, and it should be undefined, and I cannot calculate the limit. So what I have to do is try and factor this and reduce it as much as possible, then I can substitute 1 without any complications, all right? So I'm going to reverse the order of difference on the top. Uh, limit as x approaches 1, if I reverse uh, the order of a subtraction, you're going to end up with the opposite, so it's going to be minus x squared minus 1 for the numerator. And then the denominator, notice I can factor out an x, x divided by x to the third minus 1. Okay? Now I can factor the numerator and the denominator further using the difference of squares factoring technique. I'll factor the numerator into x minus 1 times x plus 1. And then using the difference of cubes uh, formula, I'll factor x to the third minus 1 into x minus 1 times x squared plus x plus 1. Okay? If you forgot to the difference of cubes formula, basically it's a to the third minus b to the third equals a minus b times a squared. So for this one, the sign is the same, the next one is the opposite, which is plus AB, and then the last sign is also plus, plus B squared. So this is basically the formula that I use to compute, to factor or this difference of Q right here. In this case, A is X and B is 1. That's how I came up with this expression factor right here, okay? All right. Uh, um, let's go ahead and simplify this further. If you notice, X minus 1 is come. It's common in the numerator and denominator, so x minus 1 goes here once, and x minus 1 goes there once. So we're going to be left with the limit as x approaches 1 of negative x plus 1 over x times x squared plus x plus 1. Okay? Now we can now make a substitution. We're going to plug in 1 into the x's. Uh, we're going to have negative 1 plus 1 divided by... 1 times 1 squared plus 1 plus 1. That simplifies into negative 2 in the numerator over 1 times 1 squared plus 1 plus 1. This is just 1, so 3. So this simplifies into 2 over 3. Negative 2 over 3. That's the value of your limit. Your answer is B. Alright? Okay, let's move on to the next question. Question number 2. Because what are the slope of the tangent length of the function f of x equals ln times for x plus 3 at the point where x equals power 3? So we basically know that the slope is basically uh, the slope m of x is the same thing as the slope is the same as the derivative at x. Okay, so all we need to do is find the derivative at x, and then we're going to plug in uh, pi over 3 for the x in our derivative function to calculate what the slope is. Okay. So let's rewrite the function f of x equals the natural logarithm of sine square x plus 3. Now we're going to find the derivative. The derivative here, we're going to make use of the uh, natural logarithm function and the chain rule because we have a function in here. And then we're going to use the power rule here. And then the trigonometric uh, rule here. And then a constant rule for the 3. Okay. So Using the derivative of a natural log of x, this whole expression is going to become 1 over sine square x plus 3. 
How is that possible? Because we know that ln x prime is equal to 1 over x. Alright, so that's how I came up with this. Now we're going to use the chain rule for this inner expression. So times, um, times, now let's differentiate this. To differentiate this, we're going to do a term by term. If I want to differentiate the sine squared x, I'll first have to apply the power rule and then um, differentiate it using the truth function. Okay, so if I want to differentiate sine squared x, we're going to have 2 sine x, that's for the power, and then times the derivative of sine, which is cosine x. Alright? Plus the derivative of 3, which is a constant, which is 0. Okay? So f prime of x is going to be com 2 sine x cosine x divided by uh, sine square x plus 3. We need a slope when x is equal to pi over 3, so what I'm going to do is plug in pi over 3 for all the variables. So f prime of pi over 3 equals 2 sine pi over 3 cosine pi over 3 divided by sine uh, sine pi over 3 and this one is square because of that square plus 3. Okay? All right, we know that, um, let me write this on the side, we know that sine pi over 3 is over 3 over 2, and cosine pi over 3 is 1 half, so we're going to plug in those arguments into, into our expression here on the right side. So it's going to become 2 times 3 over 2 times 1 over 2 uh, divided by uh, root 3 over 2 squared plus 3. Okay. Alright, let's simplify further. You notice these two 2's cancel. 2 goes here 1, 2 goes here 1. So we're going to have root 3 over 2 divided by, if you square this, you're going to end up with 3 over 4 plus 3. Okay. Now to resolve this, the denominator for this 3 over 1, find the LCD. You times it by 4, top and bottom, times by 4, times by 4. So we're going to have, um, it's going to become the square root of 3 over 2 divided by, uh, this is 12 plus 3, 15 over 4. And then you can multiply the numerator by the reciprocal of the denominator, which is uh, 4 over 15. So it goes here 1, 2 goes here 2. The final answer is going to be 2 root, uh, 2 root 3 over 15. So this is the slope at x equals 2, uh, at x equals pi over 3. So our answer is c. Okay? Alright, so there you have it. Uh, let's move along uh, to the next question. Question number 3 says if g is the inverse of f, find g, find g prime of uh, 3. So first thing we want to do is find the inverse of f, which is going to be g. So f inverse of x is basically g, okay? So how do we find that inverse? Well, let me rewrite this function as y equals the square root of 2x plus 1. To find the inverse, I'll switch the y and my x, the y is in the x's, and then I'll solve for my new y, okay? So notice what I'm going to do here. I'm going to write this as x equals the square root of 2y plus 1. What on earth did I just do? I just switched the x's and the y's because that's what's inverting means the input becomes the output and the output becomes the input. So if I solve for y, that will be an inverse of f, x, which is g of x, okay? So let's do this. So to isolate y, I will square both sides, square the left side and the right side. And I'm going to have, I'm going to use the reflexive property of equality, move this to the right, 2y plus 1 equals x squared. And then we can just subtract 1 and divide by 2, right? So 2y equals x squared minus 1. Divide both sides by 2. We have y equals x squared minus 1 over 2. This is the inverse. This is the inverse of f. So um, um, f inverse of x, which is equal to g of x, equals x squared minus 1 over 
two. Okay, so um, the next thing I ask is to find. So now we need to find a uh, g prime of three. So to find g prime of three, we have to find the derivative first. Okay, so what is? Let's rewrite g of x in a way that's easy to compute the derivative. Okay, I don't want to use a quotient rule, so I'm going to split up this fraction into x squared over two minus one over two. Okay. It is possible to write down a, a function so that the differentiation is easier is always advisable to do so. All right, now let's do the derivative g prime of x. g prime of x is going to be 2x over 2 using the power rule. This is a constant minus 0. Okay, so this simplifies into x. So g prime of 3, just plug in 3 there, equals 3. There goes your final answer. The answer to this problem is E. Okay? Alright, moving right along, let's take a look at the question number four. It's a related rates problem. I have a lot of practice problems on this on agroserve.com, so you might want to go look it up. So it says oil is poured on a flat surface and is raised to pour out to form a circle. The area of the circle is increasing at a constant rate of uh, five centimeters square our rate is the radius increasing um, when the radius is five centimeters so this is the rate of change of the area this piece right here this is change of area so it's basically the ADT and our rate is the radius increasing increasing the RDT we do not know what it is and this piece right here is what R is right so in order to find a formula that relates these three, we're obviously going to use the area formula for geometry. A equals uh, pi r squared. So we differentiate the respect to time implicitly to uh, generate a, a, a related rate equation that we can solve by substituting in these arguments. All right. So if I differentiate both sides with respect to time, I'll have dA dt equals d dt of pi r squared. Okay. I'm going to apply the constant rule on the left, on the right side. So that gives me the ability to factor out pi. Now if I differentiate r squared, I'm going to have 2r using the power rule times the r dt. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, we know that, um, let me put this info on the side, um, the adt, the rate of change of the area, the rate of change of the area uh, is 5 centimeters square per second. The R D T, the rate of change of the radius, is what we're looking for. And we know that the radius is, at that instant, is 5. Okay, when the radius is 5 centimeters, what our rate is the radius changing. Alright, so it looks like we have one equation, one unknown, so we can go ahead and solve. Alright, so let's plug it in, plug in what we know, and find what we need. So the A D T is 5, equals pi times 2 R, R is 5, the R D T. Okay. Alright, so to get the RDT by itself, we just simplify the uh, right side a little bit more and then divide. So we're going to have 5 equals 10 pi, the RDT, and then divide both sides by 10 pi. And then we're going to have the RDT, these ones cancel out. And then you can divide by 5 top and bottom, you're going to have 1 over 2 pi uh, centimeters, sorry, centimeters of square per second, centimeters square per second, actually centimeters per second, I'm sorry, so the rate is uh, length per second, so centimeters per second, so this is the rate at which the, the radius, at which the radius is changing, okay, all right, so that means our answer is A, yeah, okay, last but not the least, uh, question number five, is that let f be a function on uh, a closed interval or continuous function on a closed interval 0, 3, and let c be the point in 0, 3 such that fc equals 2 is the maximum value of f on 0, 3, which cannot be true. So, when we think about the maximum value of a function over an interval, it tells you what the maximum area can be. Okay, because any any value of f below that area, below that maximum, is going to generate less area, okay? So, let's take a look at a, uh, an area model real quick. So, this is 1, 
2, 3. And then 1, 2, the maximum, this is 2. So this is the maximum that the function can attain right here on that interval. So if we take a look at this interval, what does that tell me? It tells me that if f is constantly at that maximum value, then the biggest possible area that um, uh, the big, biggest possible area that, that can be enclosed under this curve is going to be the area of this rectangle right here. So biggest area, biggest area, biggest area is basically 3 times 2, which equals 6. So that's the biggest area that can be enclosed by this function. That is assuming that the function attains the maximum value for the entire interval. If the function took it, takes a dip, down like something like this, what does that tell me? It tells me that this area right here will be excluded from the final area, so it's going to be less. So anytime the function goes less than the maximum value, even though it goes into the negative, that's even worse, because now you have to subtract all this entire. Anytime it takes a dip, this value keeps falling. Okay, so if the function assumes the maximum value for the entire interval, then the biggest area is simply going to be given by um, is simply going to be given by the area under here. Okay? Alright. Okay, so how can we express the area under this curve using uh, calculus? So the area under this curve right here, so maximum area, maximum area is basically the integral, the definite integral from 0 to 3 of the function f of x. And the maximum area has to be, so this area has to be equal to, the, the area has, of the function has to be, since it's the maximum, it doesn't always have to be the maximum. So this area, this integral represents the area under the curve has to be less than or equal to 6. Okay? If it's bigger than 6, that forces the function to go above this. Okay, because this value right here is f of c, which equals 2. If the function is bigger than, it goes above the ceiling, then the area gets bigger than 6. That's not allowable. So, the, so this integral has to be less than or equal to 6. So let's look at what is violated here. Is there any, are there any options that violate this constraint on the area? Absolutely. Option D says that the area is going to be 7. That's impossible. If the maximum value is 2, which forces the maximum area to be 6. So your answer to this option is D. Okay? So thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video. Please feel free to subscribe to my videos by clicking up here. Uh, you can share this video with your friends on Facebook and Twitter. More videos can be found on MyClickSub.com. Thanks again and have a wonderful day.